Well, today was supposedly the first day of this Formula One Bahrain Grand Prix, and this has become a, a major flashpoint in in uh, the uprising, um, and it's kind of regained, give, given the, the the protest movement new momentum and new and a new lease of life, because the focus today has been on Bahrain. Um, the focus has been on on the protest. The focus has been on whether this race should go ahead and the controversy surrounding that. And um, so we, we, we had a huge march in, in northern Bahrain, uh, pro uh, around, I think the estimates are at least 50,000 people attended that. And the title and the theme was there's no going back. Mm. So Bahrain firmly stated that there's no going back to the status quo. Bahrain can only move forward. Um, but... Uh, Otherwise, but as usual, the, the protest was met with sheer repression. It was tear gas. It was uh, protesters were met with stun grenades and birdshot pellets. So as, as usual, at the end of the day, I'm now counting the number of injuries. We're trying to gather how many people have been arrested and um, try and really count our losses. Uh, meanwhile, you know, uh, people are celebrating the Formula One, uh, trying to enjoy this sport on the other side of the island as if the village next door isn't suffocating from tear gas. But unfortunately, this is the division in the country now. You have a ruling family that's in complete denial and people who are being, who are suffering and living in misery on the other side of the island. And now, have you seen, um, uh, obviously the United States has, has a military relationship and a, ba a large base there. And uh, outside experts, including John Timoney, an American police officer, um, and John Yates from Britain have come to, I guess, to advise the Ministry of the Interior. H have you seen any change in the way that they've dealt with protests since that time or, or not? Well, we've, yeah, we believe that they're a pretty face to an ugly regime. I mean, it's window dressing what we've seen. Then the, the police force and the security forces need to be completely dismantled and rebuilt again on more nationalistic representative grounds. Ultimately, whatever organizational changes you'll introduce, if the person facing protesters on the street is a foreigner, is alien to the community that they're policing, um, you're never going to build those bridges that you claim to, that is, are so important for the country to move forward. Um, Ultimately, the police, the, the security services are run at the top by two foreign men, one American, one British, and at the bottom by an army of foot soldiers from Pakistan, Yemen, Syria, and Jordan. Um, and this just perpetuates the conflict and the crisis because they're seeing both sides see the other as a completely alien force. There's no, there's, no, uh, there, there's no such thing as community policing in this country. That's why we've seen uh, clashes taking place between protesters and police. Um, and um, the, the police are just the face of this very brutal regime that refuses to acknowledge uh, the rights of the people to either protest peacefully or to actually express their opinion freely. And now, am I right that you had, um, I think you had some interaction with uh, Bernie Eccleston, the, the head of Formula One, mm -hmm. a few, few days ago, I think maybe last week. Uh, what, what did he tell you about uh, going ahead with the race? Well, I met with Bernie Eccleston first in, in London on March the 6th, and I spent two hours chatting to him, and he called me last week to express his concern over Abdul Hadi Khwaja. I mean, I raised the issue, but he told me that this was a personal uh, concern of his as well. Um, we, I think he was just uh, trying to throw some ideas about how he can, the opposition can engage with the race. Um, instead of being, uh, you know, thrown out. And I said to him, you know, quite honestly, that I don't think uh, these ideas of yours would, would, would fly with the government. Um, they, I don't think they would let anyone within one kilometer of the racetrack. And, and as unsurprisingly, uh, apparently, fans who were entering the racetrack were getting screened, their faces were being screened because they have thousands of headshots of protesters in there to prevent them from entering the racetrack. Um, I mean, I was invited, but I wouldn't attend. But, um, so, I, again, I urged Bernie to take a firmer stance in calling for uh, at least the release of political detainees, for the release of Mr. Abdul Hadi al uh, and to stop the country from going down and, and slipping into an abyss. And it's, uh, quite frankly, it's, I mean, for him to have suggested that he could facilitate a dialogue between the opposition and the government just seems ludicrous for, 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 a, for, for the Formula One uh, 
to be the, the, the platform for a political dialogue between, you know. But at the same time, it seems ludicrous, but what Sheikh Salman was saying today was that, yes, the sport should build bridge communities. So there's this kind of vicious circle going around of, like, it's not political, you know, this is politics is different from sport, but then it's saying, well, if it does go ahead, it will build bridges and communities, and you know. So it's either way, it's it's just so politicized to say otherwise is just a fallacy. Yeah, there are three. The, the the debate and the narrative around the controversy of having Formula One has been primarily about the security of race, races and and driving teams. Uh, secondly, about the politicization of sports, whether there's a place for sport in countries that that. Um, uh, responsible for human rights abuses, and thirdly about the reputation of the sport. You know, is this going to tarnish the 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 image of the sport and the brand, the F1 brand? Um, that's really what's framed the debate. I mean, all along, what what we were saying was well, actually we're not against the sport or anything like that, but we're saying that we actually fear it will will see an increase in the repression. So the ethical question is around whether it's right for us to go to a country that will have to effectively introduce martial law for the race to go ahead just because it, it's so paranoid it needs to suppress the peaceful protests. And that's exactly what we've seen. Over the past week, there's been at least 100 arrests. It seems like uh, uh, activists were under surveillance for the last month or two and preemptively the government has uh, handpicked and arrested the, the very active youth from each village hmm. a week before the Formula One started. And we haven't seen the use of uh, shotgun pellets over the last month or two, and suddenly a week before the Formula One, the police are res resuming their use of shotgun pellets. And so we've seen an increase in the number of injuries and the number of, uh, of people who are treated at home because they're too fearful to go to the hospital for treatment. So that, to me, it was a very simple case of uh, it's not about. It's not just about the safety of drivers. It's about the safety of protesters, who, who in trying to get their message across peacefully, will be suppressed violently, um, and that really has been absent from the larger debate. Do you, Do you think, though? I think uh, you might have said earlier today in another interview. I saw that uh, even maybe accidentally that there, there was a blessing in disguise of the world's attention being focused on because of the race on, on what's happening mm -hmm. politically. Do you feel like that's still true? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I've, uh, I think the, the attention that the race has received and the global opinion around whether this Formula One should go ahead has been a blessing because it's actually turned the, the coin on its head. Um, we've seen such opposition um, from fans and from, uh, from, from people across the world from politicians, from uh, journalists, from from um, NGOs, to really, they everyone's going to have their way to make a point um, to stand with the people and and in solidarity with the with the pro democracy movement. So that's been fantastic. I mean, just seeing that and just seeing Bahrain being uh, propelled into the headlines is quite frankly. Um, uh, you know, that, that we have to thank the Formula One for that. Um, otherwise, this wouldn't have happened. But we've all been said. We've, what we've been saying all along is that, uh, despite the international agenda that's working against the Bahraini uh, pro-democracy movement, um, the Western allies who are still backing the regime, uh, the focus should have been should shouldn't divert away from Bahrain after the race leaves. Um, and that's our fear: is that we just get you know our, our 15 minutes. A fame um, in the in the calendar when F1 is coming to the country, and as soon as F1 uh, happens and leaves or gets cancelled or whatever happens, that's it. Um, we drop again to to, no to nothing when it comes to media coverage, mm. um, and we've seen how media plays out into these revolutions and how how effective they can be in pressurising the government. So I, I believe that the this was always going to be a lose lose situation for the government. Um, uh, if it got cancelled, they lose. If it goes ahead and they get this, and it backfires um, in terms of the negative branding of the of the sporting event, then they lose as well. So I, I quite frankly, I think that it's um, our, our our work and our job has been done effectively in terms of focusing on the F one 
Um, I'm kind of, as an activist, I don't want to put the focus on the Formula One itself, that our, our struggle is much broader and much bigger than the F1, and it will continue after the F1 leaves the country. And can I just ask you also, um, uh, for people who might not be familiar with it, what, what's your, your own personal uh, family's involvement in, in what's happened? What, what's actually happened to you through, through the, last, the last year? Well, I was born and raised in the UK because my father is an, uh, is a, is an opposition uh, leader um, and he's also been sentenced to life imprisonment. He's in the same case as Abdul Hadi Um I, I just moved to Bahrain in 2009 um, and, and I was a lecturer and I lectured at the university and then when the, the uprising began on February the 14th, like many, I took to the street to call for pro-democracy pro reforms. Um, and then having seen the, the crackdown begin with the Saudi troops crossing the bridge and uh, seeing the, 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 clamp, the, the crackdown take place in, in, the, in some of the most horrific forms. Um, personally, my husband was arrested in April. Um, he disappeared for two months. You know, and I only saw him for the first time in the military court. So when, when, you, when, you're, when you get personally involved and you see tragedy touch your own life, you, you kind of have no other choice than to, to participate and to, to fight against this injustice that you see happening in front of you. I mean, I was living in an ivory tower and I was an academic and um, I had a life very different from the life I was leading now. Uh, but now the struggle has taken over my life and uh, I, I see no other cause that's more, that, that's more worthy than the one um, I'm living through now. And... Um, I, in that, in that sense, it's been very dramatic and very um, enriching, um, despite the pain and the misery and the grief that we've had to endure, along with thousands of other Bahrainis. And your 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 husband was he he was sentenced at the same court as Abdul Hadi Al Khwaja, is that right? That's correct. There was one military court in the country, and um, they had a marathon of trials. Um, my husband's case was a misdemeanor. It was a minor case. He was only sentenced for participating in an illegal gathering. Um, he wasn't in the bigger, kind of bigger, more serious cases, um, but he wasn't involved. He was apolitical. He was just dragged into the conflict in revenge rather than because of any anything that he ever did himself. Mm. Um, so... Um, you know, I've seen how the, these military courts operate and how they were show trials. Uh, they were just, uh, literally the sentences were just handed out like parking tickets, 15-year sentences, uh, and 600 detainees remain in prison today on very serious charges, having been denied fair trials, having been denied due process, having been subjected to torture, having been... Um, uh, you know, denied their basic rights to represent themselves and their cases and to defend themselves. So I really do know personally how that feels. And, and, as, and I know how the pain of the family must get, like the empathy that you feel because you, you've endured the same thing just puts, uh, just puts you on a different level with the people. And do you feel any pressure uh, that it, it's, do you feel pressure about speaking out? Is there some sort of... Uh... Is there no personal pressure to keep quiet and out of fear it might uh, hurt your husband or your father's cases? Well, that risk is always there. I mean, I've always said that having someone else punished on your behalf because my husband was uh, arrested because of his relationship to my family, nothing else, it kind of made it, a lot more made it a lot worse for me to handle than I was ready and prepared to take the hit. Um, but he wasn't, and it was just take, it took me by surprise for a, for a long time for me to realize that. Um, but the fear and the risk is always there. But if you have nothing left to lose, um, there's nothing left to fear. And um, and I, I feel very liberated that I've overcome that fear. And um, and I think many on the street uh, who face guns with their bare chests, who who who, who seriously have uh, no fear of the police or the government anymore, um, where you see dissent at such a large scale and at such a lot, huge proportion of the population. You know you're on the right side and you're very confident that there'll be a positive resolution eventually to the conflict and that you'll attain your very kind of legitimate uh, grievance uh, demands and eventually you know your grievances will be addressed. I think it just uh, it's inevitable.